quick start for today's autonomy talks. Today it's a pleasure that we have with us uh, Professor Sawyer Fuller, that is uh, known for creating uh, biologically inspired sensors, control systems, and mechanical designs for insect flight control. Uh, he graduated from MIT and completed his PhD in biological engineering at the California Institute of Technology, and also um, did the postdoctoral training at Harvard. I think in addition to his work on insect flight control, he's also famous for having developed a, a frog hopping robot at NASA Jet Propulsion, Propulsion Laboratory and invented an inkjet printer capable of fabricating millimeter scale 3D metal machines. His work at the inter is a the intersection of robotics and biology has appeared in the journals such as the Science and Proceedings of the National Academy, Academy of Sciences. So today we are, it's a pleasure to have you with us and we are looking forward to hearing uh, uh, what you're going to tell us. Uh, okay. Um, thank you. Um, so um, uh, my name is Sawyer Fuller uh, and I direct this lab at the University of Washington up in the sunny north um, Pacific Northwest of uh, the US in Seattle. Um, and home for famous things such as Starbucks and Boeing and um, Amazon and Microsoft, all you know, very tech hub place uh, these days. Um, so we're you know, a great place to do this kind of research. So we um, focus on this task of building in many cases, physically, insect-sized robots. And by insect-sized robots, I actually mean the robots about the size of commonly encountered insects, like uh, flies and bees, not the five gram rhinoceros beetle. Um, flies and bees are around you know, 100 milligrams. So that's what I'm talking about. So um, let's just start at the beginning. Um, why would you want to make an insect-sized robot? And I'll just try to motivate it by two uh, key applications that motivate me and I guess motivate the, 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 um, the students who work in my group. Uh, the first is illustrated on the left here. It's a oil and gas refinery. And maybe imagine your job is to find all of the leaks, gas leaks, um, in a place like this. And they could be anywhere. They could be two stories up on an overhang uh, back in tiny corners between two other pipes, that sort of thing. Uh, we think this task is well suited to tiny insect sized robots uh, because it can be performed by um, simple biology inspired behaviors that don't require precise localization. All the robot needs to do is to be able to sense the gas um, and then uh, fly up wind when it does so. Um, and there are tiny gas sensors now coming of, becoming available. So in the envisaged scenario, you would arrive at the facility with maybe a pelican case full of, um, of these little insect-sized robots. Um, you'd open it up and they would scatter, maybe searching around randomly, essentially. Uh, maybe they'd avoid obstacles, that sort of thing, have a little bit of intelligence. Um, but uh, they, would, they would fly around until one of them detected a, a smell. And then when the robot detected the smell, it would, um, and, and detect it through some mechanism, it would detect that it had found this, the source uh, by flying up wind to it and then maybe identifying some aspect that, that characterizes uh, plume sources. Uh, it would land on it uh, and then maybe a emit a radio frequency sound that would, uh, you could then, a human operator could then detect. So, it does this kind of insect inspired search strategy um, and lands and emits a beacon that uh, you, you, maybe you have a transponder or something like that that would go off for a human operator when they detected that they found the smell. Um, so in this way, uh, the human then could patch the leak. And if you had these running all the time, searching for leaks, you might be able to um, much more quickly patch leaks and thereby do things like reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, a second example is space exploration. And this uh, was actually uh, suggested, um, I guess, in a serious way by uh, Rodney Brooks and Anita Flynn 
Rodney Brooks, former head of the AI lab. Uh, he wrote, uh, he and Anita Flynn wrote a uh, paper called Fast, Cheap and Out of Control, a Robot Invasion of the Solar System, where they envisioned uh, extremely um, lightweight robots uh, performing planetary science. Um, and the benefit here is that um, one of the largest sources of mission costs um, is actually the launch cost, the cost to get the robot out of low Earth orbit. Um, it's, it's been going down very quickly recently, but um, it, you know, is in the order of a hundred, uh, sorry, $10,000 per kilogram into low earth orbit. But if you imagine, you can imagine if your robot is less than a gram, now you're talking, uh, what is that? Um, a thousandth of a kilo, you know, $10 launch costs, something like that. So you know, this may be exciting, a potential way to make space exploration a little bit cheaper. So, um, so those are two applications that, that, uh, that, that we think about. Um, a few asides on those, um, they both benefit from the, the ability to leave the ground and perhaps fly. So uh, we, we really focus on flying. The reason for that is that then you can surmount almost any obstacle um, and you can also come very close to sensing targets. Maybe that means you can tolerate uh, lower, um, lower, uh, sensitivity in your sensor, and that means your sensor can be uh, smaller. Um, you could also imagine other applications related to this and sensing, uh, maybe you could search for forest fires, uh, very important uh, in this part of the world, Pacific Northwest, California, uh, or landmine detection or monitoring agriculture down and inside the plant canopy, for example. Um, and later uh, performing tasks, maybe in teams where you move or build things. Uh, these all benefit from being really small and really light uh, and also uh, being able to operate around humans without impact hazard. Um, one of the things that really excites me about them though is it, and I think what really sets them apart from larger robots is that they uh, require very little power. Um, in, in the case of our RoboFly, we're talking um, in the order of a few hundred milliwatts, excuse me, a few hundred milliwatts. And so um, you can imagine potentially powering them from power sources that are uh, too weak to power larger robots, maybe indoor lighting using a photovoltaic tune to indoor lighting, um, maybe even Wi-Fi access points, um, which emit about 100 milliwatts. Um, so you, you can imagine these robots actually um, operating persistently and harvesting energy from the environment. So we have this just, is I, I imagine a future where we just have these robots kind of everywhere and they're always running and they're sensing things and telling us a lot more about the environment than, than we, we used to know uh, for any number of applications. So there's kind of a, I think I foresee a revolution in robotics and these insect robots. From a controls and autonomy perspective, they're also very interesting. Um, they're in this Goldilocks regime where they're small enough to be, have these capabilities that distinguish them from other robots, um, but they're also uh, large enough um, that they can actually, thanks to the consumer electronics industry, carry a pretty sophisticated sensory suite, um, thanks to miniaturization pressure. And this makes them interesting from a robotics perspective because now we can talk about making them uh, somewhat smart. Um, so, uh, and so, you know, and the other side of it is there's lots of interesting questions surrounding how do you make an autonomous system this small? Everything from how do you control it, how do you actuate it, how to sense it. Um, and in particular, let's, so that brings us to the next point is that um, it's interesting, but it's hard. Um, and why it's hard boils down to the physics of scaling laws. Things are different at small scales. Uh, so, just uh, the first example is um, consider if you consider a robot of wings, uh, wingspan L, maybe, uh, yeah, so maybe it's L, the wingspan is L, its mass varies to first order with the um, wingspan raised to the third. And you see this uh, if you look at kind of quad rotor aircraft um, at varying scales, they, they follow a pretty close power law where the mass goes as the length to the third, uh, its volume approximately. So this is one example of scaling laws. So I'm just gonna give two examples of scaling laws that play a role in insect robotics. Um, in the area of mechanics, friction is largely a surface dependent quantity. Um, so it depends on uh, area, which depends approximately with L squared. 
Uh, you can imagine a sphere of size L, its area goes as uh, pi r squared, I believe, and its volume goes as four thirds pi r cubed. Uh, so these, put my physics hat on here, <laughs> reducing everything to a sphere. Uh, okay, so it's, but the, the point being that here's the, the, the mass goes as L to the third, the um, friction goes as L squared. So if you relate things to the unit mass, which is a kind of a useful thing to think about, uh, then it gets stronger and stronger as mass uh, goes, uh, the length scale goes smaller. Anything with a negative exponent gets relatively larger as you go small scale. Um, so this means we have to think about how to reduce it as much as possible and this suggests at small scales, we probably won't be able to do things that uh, larger robots do. Uh, and in particular, um, it, uh, for insect-sized robots, uh, we don't see um, gliding. And you see this in it, uh, small insects as well and small birds, actually small insects and birds by and large in nature, they don't um, glide. They must flap their wings continuous to, to hover. And you see this in hummingbirds as well as flies and bees. Um, the other side of it, is is um, spinning propellers uh, tend to increase uh, or cause, lead to a lot of um, uh, surface friction as well because you have a, a sliding joint inside the motor that must spin. And so, uh, and small propellers uh, seem to need to spin fast. So this uh, is unfavorable to small pinning propellers as well, um, which leads us to building insect-sized robots that uh, flap with flapping wings rather than um, spinning propellers. Another example is comes from the, and, and by the way, if you have any questions, uh, I, I'm not, uh, I'm happy to uh, answer questions. Please feel free to jump in. On the side of control and sensing, we need to be very careful about power consumption. And this means that uh, this is because our battery is very constrained. Uh, it's roughly proportional to the uh, mass of the robot. Um, so as the robot gets small, the battery gets small. So that really means we have to probably avoid emissive sensors like depth cameras or scanning laser rangefinders. Um, but uh, the, the bigger picture is just uh, scaling laws mean that many of the technologies that have been super successful in larger robots are probably not going to be available at insect robots, uh, which means there's an interesting challenge here. How do you do power constrained control, uh, but also an opportunity to invent new ways of doing things, which is, um, which is quite exciting. The good news is that uh, we're in the very fortunate situation that we can be assured that it is possible because we uh, can see that your animals like this fly are um, able to do all these all these things quite well on their own. Thank you. Um, and what's more, uh, they do so with amazing capability. Um, you can see this fly is performing flips, keeping itself very much under control as is illustrated by the fact that its head actually is staying level, even though its body is rotating. And then, of course, it executes a perfect landing. Uh, OK, so these guys represent both uh, proof that it's possible and also a performance target that we'd love to um, achieve someday, uh, which we're far from, far from now. OK, so these questions uh, are the questions of the um, Autonomous Insect Robotics Lab that I uh, direct uh, at the University of Washington. And so um, let's just talk about, so I'm gonna dive into some of our contributions in this large area uh, from everything from how do we actuate it to what sensors do we need? Uh, how do we control it? And um, how do we power it? Uh, so let's start um, with the side of actuation. So um, uh, the work I'm gonna talk about traces its roots very much to a uh, project uh, back at Berkeley a little more than 20 years ago, awarded to Ron Fearing. Um, along with him were my uh, PhD advisor, Michael Dickinson, who was a biologist who since moved to Caltech, uh, and Shankar Sastry, who was, uh, um, who was the, also the advisor of my PhD advisor, Richard Murray, my other PhD advisor. What Fearing recognized, um, and I think he was very correct in this, was that there are two important things when it comes to building uh, insect size robots. Um, the first was that uh, moving down to the size of an insect, it, it was um, the obvious way you might build things would be to use lithographic fabrication techniques derived from the semiconductor industry, uh, also known as MEMS, uh, 
which have very, been very successful in things like projectors, these micro mirror projector systems, uh, and the resonators of um, gyroscopes, for example. Uh, he recognized that these were kind of too small and too hard to build for this application. And he instead he focused on a slightly larger scale where he could use short wavelength light laser micro machining. This allowed a very fast machining time of just a few seconds and almost an un unlimited material set, uh, metals, carbon fiber, ceramics. Um, and uh, he recognized that the, um, down at that scale, he needed to rethink um, the actuator, leading him to use uh, piezoelectric actuators uh, rather than electromagnetic coils, um, because piezo materials are actuated largely electrostatically, which um, become more efficient relative to magnetic fields as scale reduces because there's just less uh, heat losses. You see a lot of heat losses in um, tiny magnetic coils. His first prototypes were pretty clunky and they were made of metal, as shown by this guy. Uh, but a few years later, they were uh, starting to, um, starting to uh, flap uh, and be made of high performance carbon fiber. Uh, a, few year, what, a few years later, one of his grad students, Rob Wood, who was my postdoc advisor, uh, went off and founded a lab at Harvard where he refined the technique and achieved uh, the first lift greater than weight in a 100 milligram device. This I think is actually maybe 80 milligrams here. Um, and one of his innovations was to, uh, unlike this version where they were uh, very much uh, captured by trying to reproduce the wing kinematics of a of a of a exact wing kinematics of an insect by fully actuating this wing, both the angle of attack and the, the sweep angle. Uh, what Rob realized was that he could allow the, the 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 angle of attack to rotate passively on the passive hinge, and then only he actually he only actuated the the stroke angle. Uh, and this led to a much simpler mechanism, and that was key to getting the lift greater than weight. Um, let's see, a few years later and lots more refinements, um, uh, his group, and I was a part of this effort, uh, achieved the first controlled flight. We had the great honor of getting this published in science. Um, and um, so, so then a few years after that, I started my own group. Um, and we've since, you know, one of the advancements we've made is the first uh, time one of these robots has uh, taken off without, uh, there's a little wire here on this guy. We made the first one to take off without a wire. Look, Ma, no wires. Um, so that's a brief history. Uh, and I'll return to how we did that wireless flight. Um, but uh, let's talk about how uh, this process has been developed and refined to build them. Uh, the fabrication technique is, um, uh, I guess it's been, it was called by Ron Fearing, and that's what I call it, uh, spark composite microstructures. It entails a, a laser, a short wavelength UV laser cutting parts out like this. Um, and then, um, and this takes, maybe it will take a few passes at this, but it takes, you know, just a couple minutes to cut out this carbon fiber sheet. This is a rigid sheet. Carbon fiber composites give you high strength to weight ratio. Uh, then we pin align these sheets um, under, and then press them together under heat and pressure. And this, um, this white material is a sheet adhesive that uh, melts and bonds. And then this yellow material is a thin, flexible material, high temperature plastic polyimide. And this is used as a flexure material that allows uh, uh, for hinges, articulated joints. Then we put it under a microscope and very carefully with tweezers, we you know, we leave the part in the scaffold and we use the scaffold to help fold it into shape. Let's see. Um, so that's the fabrication process in a nutshell. Uh, a little bit about piezo actuation. Uh, to first order what a piezo uh, actuator does, the reverse piezo effect is to um, shrink a tiny bit when you apply a voltage. So if I, this is a bimorph, it has two slabs of piezo here. And if I put an electric field shown by these arrows here on this side, it shrinks, this side shrinks along its length by a tiny amount, uh, maybe a, a tenth of a percent. And then because it's in this long bimorph, it bends the tip like this. Similarly, if you put the electric field and you only wanna put the electric field in one direction in the type of piezo material we work with. So similarly, if you put the 
field on the other half of the piezo, it shrinks and bends in this way. Um, and then if you um, tie that to a, a mechanical amplifier so that this tiny tip motion leads um, through a mechanism of transmission, we call it, it can lead to a large uh, sweep of the wings here, maybe 90 degrees or more. Um, this is how we get a large, large stroke angle like this. Uh, so that's, that's how we actuate the wings. This is what these little tiny piezo actuators look like. This gray material is the, the PZT ceramic. It's also called PZT for short, lead zirconium titanate. Um, and uh, this is what a wing looks like seen from above, flapping at a high frame rate. This is flapping. And these wings, they'll flap maybe in the range of 100 to 200 beats per second. OK, so um, at UW, one of, the, um, one of the downsides we wanted to address about the design that, uh, of the RoboBee uh, from Harvard that was uh, it was the first one to achieve controlled flight, but all great things need their refinements. And this one does as well, too. If you look at this exploded view, what you'll see is that it has loads of little parts. And if you've ever tried to hold a tiny part with tweezers and then accidentally let go or the part shifts a little bit, it can shoot across the room and you'll never find it again. I can tell you that much. Uh, so uh, what we said was, well, maybe we can reduce the number of parts here. Um, and this guy, let's see. Uh, so here's the RoboFly, uh, which, um, which came out of our group, which has a much smaller number of parts here. And um, let's see, uh, getting the animation right. Oh, I'm pushing the wrong button. That's what's going on here. Okay. So um, this guy had 21 parts, uh, five layers to build it. Uh, what we realized is if we, um, if we, we realized we could actually make the whole airframe out of a single laminate sheet folded together, uh, drastically cutting the part count down to eight from 21 and making many fewer parts that you have to carefully uh, assemble and that you could lose uh, in exchange for a couple more layers, which is a reasonable um, reasonable compromise, I think. And this is the procedure that we use to fold it. So essentially we start with a flat sheet that we've, where we've uh, decided the locations of the folds, some of which we glue and fix and others of which remain flexible as intrinsic uh, parts of the mechanism uh, the, maybe the transmission or the um, or other articulated parts that are part of the mechanism of flapping the wings. So there's the piezo, and then we bond the the, the uh, wing there, and there's a passive hinge up here at the top too. Uh, so that's nice. So that makes it quite a bit easier to build these guys. Um, next, let's talk a little bit about um, some other advances that we've built on top of that, our new design. Uh, one, of the one of the things we discovered is that uh, flapping the wings is very complicated and it turns out to always require some calibration. So we developed a, a calibration um, system. So what happens is when you first build one of these guys and turn it on and flap both wings with the same voltage, what you see is they almost never fly up. They always do this kind of crazy thing because one wing is ine inevitably a little bit more powerful than the other. So this is a device we built uh, and it uses motion capture and a feedback loop to essentially learn the, the trim values needed to make that robot fly straight up. If you put it back on this tiny spider web tether, it, now it can fly basically straight up. And then we can use that to then, um, in our, as, as a trim value, so then when we close the loop, uh, we can achieve hovering flight. And that makes, this makes for the, the trimming process when we first build a robot much easier. These little, um, Things here are motion capture markers. And by the way, there's a bunch of cameras above here. This is an insect size, sized flight arena here. And this wire tether goes down to some piezo amplifiers and you're running a XPC target to, uh, to do the control computations at about a kilohertz, 10 kilohertz. Um, another thing we uh, realized with this new design that's much lower to the ground is that we could, uh, it was actually much easier to land it. Um, than the, than the Ruby. And another thing we could do is, um, is uh, it turns out you can use the wings to actuate it and it can move along the ground as well too. And so here's a video of it uh, actually crawling under a door. Uh, so 
with this, we can avoid the difficulty of opening a doorknob. We just squeeze underneath the door. Uh, so now we've got a multimodal robot as well. It can fly and ambulate across the ground too. Uh, another advance. Um, so we saw in the science paper that um, that uh, you, you might, well, here's a video of it uh, hovering in the paper where we first got it hovering in science. Uh, you might notice that it's actually rotating around a vertical axis. And, it, and the reason it, for that is that we actually had to go to great lengths to avoid, to, to design a controller that was able to operate regardless of the orientation, its heading angle. Um, and, um, and the reason for that is because this design actually, we, we were just unable to actuate this, this yaw or heading angle. So um, what uh, we did was we said, well, uh, one of the reasons for that is in, in theory, you can actuate yaw because the drag on the wings goes as a velocity squared because it's an inertially dominated flow on these wings. Um, and in theory, the way you could actuate yaw is you flap a wing faster in one direction and the other direction and you do the opposite for the other wing. This is something you can do with piezos because they're very high bandwidth. There's a lot of, you know, they have kilohertz bandwidth and we're only flapping them at a few hundred hertz. So we can add higher harmonics to there very readily. Uh, it turns out that the wings are too close to each other for this to generate enough torque to overcome wind currents and this wire tether here in a consistent basis. Uh, so what we did was we said, well, let's just orient the piezo actuators laterally and move the make the moment arm of the yaw a little bit larger. And this turned out to give us just enough moment arm that we needed to enable controlled uh, yaw angle. So here's a video of our RoboFly uh, actuating yaw. So here it is turning right and then turning left. And then turning back right. Pretty cool. And this is under closed loop feedback control. And then here's another uh, video of closed loop feedback control where they're both actuating to um, be at the same angle here. And this might not look like much, but I can tell you this was super excited, exciting for me to see these robots facing in the same direction while they're flying. I, yeah, I can't tell you how many videos they're just spinning around in a circle all the time. So uh, that was very cool. Um, why would you want this? It, one thing is it makes control much easier because you can use a simpler linear controller if you're not constantly rotating around a vertical axis. And it's useful if you wanna maybe steer a sensor or steer landing gear or something like that. Uh, so this, this is the first example of yaw control in an insect sized robot. Uh, let's see, uh, we haven't just been playing with wings. Here's a, kind of a side project. We've been playing around with this other style of uh, thrust. This is electrohydrodynamic thrust. Essentially, we have these tiny tips that generates a very strong uh, electric field that tears electrons from the molecules in the air. And we use that to then shoot these um, uh, uh, charged ions through the air. They impact air molecules. And you end up with this, what's called the ionic wind, basically a tiny tip and a high voltage makes air blow. Uh, and so we made this quad thruster design like this, and we used this, we used um, a laser to fabricate it so we could build this in just a few minutes, 10 or 20 minutes. Um, and here it is um, taking off just barely. And that's all under its own, its own thrust here. These guys use uh, about um, five kilohertz of voltage. So there's a challenge here, of five kilovolts. And so there's a challenge of how do you make that voltage on board, some future work. Okay, um, uh, next let's talk about sensing. Um, okay, so we've got actuation, we've got how do you build it, how do you take off, how do you calibrate it, a little bit about control. Now let's think about, now we wanna build the sensors on board. And this also hasn't, we haven't, there's been no demonstration of um, kind of sensor autonomy yet. So uh, it makes sense to look to biology for inspiration and in particular the flies sensory suite. Flies carry the suite of sensors, gyroscopic halteers here. Um, these ocelli or sun or sun sensor. Um, let's see, uh, they have antenna that sense wind and gravity and, and smell. They have these large compound eyes that give a nearly 360 degree view of the world. Um, let's see. And uh, one of the things that is um, they're thought to 
to do with their eyes is measure this notion of optic flow, which is a, a, uh, a measure of the speed of the visual scenery moving across the fly's visual field as it moves through space. Um, so for example, uh, this scene from taken from the campus of Boston University, uh, if you're moving forward down a sidewalk, you might see uh, straight ahead of you, not much optic flow. Uh, things on either side of you that are close have a large optic flow pattern. Maybe this tree has a large optic flow pattern. Things that are farther away but near you, uh, but, um, but on your sides have a low measure, low optic flow. Um, and so with this, this can provide kind of a cue for how, uh, both how fast you're moving and how close um, obstacles are. Uh, so that provides, um, so uh, what you'll notice here and um, what we'll, we'll kind of take away from this is you'll see that the fly actually doesn't, as far as we know, use any emissive sensors. There's no, there's no laser range finders here and there's no radar here. Um, the fly is subject to very similar constraints uh, as, as the in insect robots will have, which is that they probably can't emit power to do sensing. It's all passive sensing. And so that informs uh, our proposed sensory suite here. Um, another uh, thing I think we will probably need to do uh, is something that flies do, um, as revealed in this uh, work I did as, in, during my PhD, uh, which is that it turns out the flies actually sense um, wind, and we discovered this by blasting them with gusts of wind here. So this video is a high-speed video I took. There's a wind gust that happens about when the fly reaches here. And what happens is that it's a brief gust, 30 milliseconds, which is quite a few wing beats because these flies are flapping at 200 Hertz. Um, but uh, it slows the fly down and the fly raises up because it's getting more wind. And then the fly recovers a short while later. What we discovered is that if we remove the fly's wind sensing apparatus, its wind, wind gust response was, was quite different. Um, so that uh, suggests our sensory suite, the conjectured sensory suite for hovering. Um, we've been playing around with some of these sensors already on board. Uh, one is a tiny gyroscope, gives us a measure of angular velocity. This is one of those that's uh, been very uh, helped by miniaturization pressure from consumer goods. Um, here's a tiny laser range finder. Okay, so we are gonna make one concession to um, practicality and use a a uh, Vixel-based laser rangefinder here to measure the distance to the ground. Um, here is a tiny camera that we built um, that measures, uh, probably we'll use it to measure optic flow facing directly downward. Uh, and then uh, in addition, here's a wind sensor that um, uh, we created that uses tiny silicon strain gauges to uh, measure uh, deflections um, in this kind of yellow shaped paddle. So if the wind is blowing from the front, this paddle deflects and it, uh, this, this sensor detects that. Uh, so this is a conjectured sensory suite. Uh, if we put the mass of all these together and the power usage of all of them, they're kind of well within the range of uh, the sort of mass and power that is going to be available from our, for our tiny robot. Maybe a hundred milligram sensory suite and, um, and maybe a few tens of milliwatts for, for power, not including computation. Um, <clears throat> this camera was so small, we actually, as another project, we, we were able to put it on board a beetle. Here it is. Um, I guess, it's, I think this is a stink beetle, a, a Seattle native beetle that you see walking around sometimes. Um, and we also added, used the same um, actuator from our Robofly here on to steer the camera as well too, so we could look at places that the beetle isn't, isn't facing as well too. Let's see, so um, moving on. So uh, the next question is how do you, what sort of control do you use for this guy? And the, 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 the kind of the first challenge is um, these robots are dynamically unstable uh, in flight, much like a helicopter and much like quad rotors. So we, we need these sensors to be able to, to um, stabilize the, the attitude of the robot. And they also need to do, um, do to, to estimate the parameters that are needed to stabilize these, these, these quantities. And so um, with, with these sensors, um, it, 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 the, the system is observable and stabilizable, 
and so um, here's your here's your gyro here. This is the um, range finder. This is the airspeed sensor, and this is this optic flow system here. Um, and we can place them into an LQG um, flight controller design. And this is appealing from an insect robotics perspective because it requires uh, potentially very little computation to do, which we like because that means we're giving more power to our um, to our uh, wings than we are to our computer. And recall that we're talking about a few tens of milliwatts. So we do need to be very careful about um, ten, a few tens of milliwatts for the power budget for our sensor suite and concluding computer. So we need to be very careful about uh, what computations we do. We, we won't be able to, um, yeah. So um, uh, briefly, so maybe if we, if we write the um, Euler-Lagrange equations of our, of our robot here, um, here's our sensor model, nonlinear sensor model. Um, if we linearize it, what we can see is that the system is both controllable and stabilizable, and therefore we can use this uh, LQG controller here. Uh, and since everything, thanks to in part this ability to now actuate the yaw angle, the steering angle, the, the angle, the, the z axis angle, we can use this very simple controller. Without that, things have to be a, a bit more complicated. So that, makes, so that makes our controller very simple. Two independent uh, pitch and roll controllers running. Very few multiply accumulate operations. Um, so then we, we thought about it a little more and we said, well, you know what? Actually, uh, this is a really lightweight controller. Um, let's think about going even smaller. Um, and also let's think about, um, the, the, so the, Optic flow computation actually, so visual processing is actually going to be a fairly significant anticipated um, source of the power usage. Uh, and so, if we wanted to use optic flow, um, there's this kind of two categories optic, of optic flow we might think about, um, not including event cameras. And that's something we're thinking a little bit more about. Um, but in the meantime, um, so there's two kind of categories of optic flow estimators, or at least let's say, let's say there's, for the purposes of very low power flight control, um, an important category of optic flow estimation is involves taking derivatives of pixel readings, uh, time derivative and a spatial derivative. Um, one classical mechanism is to estimate optic flow by the gradient, which amounts to dividing the, the time and the spatial derivative by each other. And then this gives you a optic flow is this, measure of angular velocity of the visual scenery. Um, so an alternative inspired by nature is essentially just multiplying these gradients by each other. Let's see. Um, and so this, this is kind of the basis of the lucas Kanani method. And this is the what behavioral biologists have discovered is that insects appear to respond in a way that looks like they're performing this computation. And maybe this is because this is easier for neurons to compute, or maybe it's because the control task doesn't need any more precision than that. So the, the downside of this is it de depends, depends on both the spatial frequency and the contrast of the image. Um, but maybe we can overcome that either through a calibration step or by making our controller robust to these um, variabilities there. So, um, uh, Anyway, to test this idea, we, we wrote up a, um, using the Python control library, we wrote up a full simulator of our dynamical system, including the LQG controller. And what we could see is if we patterned like a texture on the ground here and then did full ray casting simulation of the visual scenery experienced by this tiny robot flying around, um, we found that uh, at least in simulation, it's able to stabilize its flight using this, this crude correlator-based optic flow measure rather than the gradient-based. Um, and in fact, the power usage is so low uh, that, uh, okay, so first of all, what's cool about this is that now we've reduced the entirety of all the controller and sensing and everything to purely, in this guy, multiply and add operations, which are very inexpensive for uh, a microprocessor to carry out. So that's nice for small scale. Um, and in fact, the power usage is so low uh, that it would use in the order of just a few hundred microwatts on a standard off-the-shelf microcontroller. 
And so this actually, we think this can scale all the way down to uh, a NAT scale robot, milligram scale robot that uh, Brooks and Flynn um, proposed back in, uh, back in the 80s. Um, so to give you a sense of scale, this is a, this is a teacup for, uh, for scale. Here it is. You can imagine a NAT landing on this teacup. Um, uh, OK, and then one, one step higher. Uh, so once you've got a stable platform that is able to hover, you can now start to think about adding high level behavior, higher level behaviors to it. Um, and this is some work I've been um, doing with uh, collaboration with Tom Daniels group in biology, where we've been exploring this, the chemical sensor on board. And one of the things we've realized is that man-made sensors, chemical sensors are relatively slow, but biology, biological chemical sensors are, um, as a rule, tend to be very fast, at least for things that it can quickly detect. And so what we said was, well, what if we can use the antenna of a moth, um, perform careful incisions here and, and connect it to tiny electrodes here and measure voltages in this uh, antenna? What if uh, with that, uh, we, can met, we can detect smells and then wrap that into a full platform that's able to fly itself and avoid obstacles and perform a cast and surge algorithm to find its way to a plume. So that's what this video shows here. Uh, there's, this is in a wind tunnel. Here's a wind coming from here. This little spot here is a, um, a scent that this uh, moth likes. It's a, a flower scent that it, it uses. I mean, this, is a, this is a hawk moth. It, uh, it uh, is a pollinator, so it gets nectar from flowers. And so it likes flowers. And so we use that, imbue that into the helicopter. It's a flower finding helicopter here. Uh, so what this helicopter is doing is it, um, it's performing a cast and surge algorithm, it's moving back and forth to the wind. It's got these fins which steer it into the wind. And then uh, it's also got a, a set of four range finders. This is the, this crazy fly platform using the, um, using the range finder deck. Um, and it's, uh, so it's avoiding these obstacles as it, and then whenever it detects the smell, it's casting here, you'll see it get a burst of red and then it surges forward, unless it's gonna run into an obstacle here. Um, and so uh, what Melanie did was she built this super high precision um, uh, amplifier that takes these tiny voltages from the moth antenna and conveys them into this uh, platform of the crazy fly helicopter. Uh, so this is the first time uh, anybody's put a moth antenna on a helicopter. And we also the first, this is also the first time I believe that anybody's tried using this passive mechanically intelligent mechanism to always steer the robot into the wind using these, these wind vanes here. So this is very cool. Um, so this shows that we're also building the higher level, higher level uh, plume, following, um, plume following work as well here too. Uh, okay. The last thing I wanted to talk about was a little more about this power story here. So there's two facets to that. The first is um, just the fact that piezo actuators require high voltages in the order of two to 300 volts. So we, if we wanna take a battery and put it on board or most other power sources are gonna come in very low voltage, um, There. We've got a coil, some high voltage transistors, and it basically through um, a clever use of this coil, we step up the seven volts we get from this laser. So this is a laser photovoltaic. There's an invisible laser that hits it and the laser hits it and it takes off uh, and then it moves out of the path of the laser and then it, it turns off after that. Um, but during that brief moment, it, this microcontroller boots up and it generates this 200 volt sinusoid signal uh, and contains the first liftoff here. So that was uh, quite impressive, first liftoff. Um, it was open loop though. So, and what you need for flight control is you need to actually be able to regulate the um, signals going to the motors. So uh, very recently we've uh, published a follow on to that. 
which is a driver that, uh, and, and in particular, an algorithm in this little microcontroller that's able to learn how to generate uh, different waveforms of different amplitudes. Um, and that's, so that requires essentially, each fly is a little bit different and we realize that we're not gonna be able to model this. So it's sort of a model-free approach to learning the, the sequence of pulses needed to, to get this waveform at different, alt different magnitudes. Um, and with this, we we're able for the first time to show that we could um, we can modulate the thrust over this range here. So we say, give me a voltage uh, sinusoid of 120 volts, uh, and it produces that, and then the thrust varies uh, in tandem. So that's nice, because now that means we have now a, the ability to uh, vary the thrust of these wings, and that's the first step toward doing uh, controlled flight using an onboard power system. Um, <clears throat> last is how to collect power. So um, this is an area we're getting into. So it's, uh, but I think I think I think it is one of the areas where tiny robots have the most potential. So um, yeah. So that because they use so little power, one of the things we're thinking about is could we power them with solar cells? Uh, okay. So some some backup here. Um, batteries. Batteries is one area where. Uh, Scaling doesn't really help us, and that's because batteries, as a rule, have to be um, encapsulated inside an uh, impermeable membrane. And what that means is as you go smaller and smaller, packaging makes more and more of a, a dominant aspect of the weight of the battery. But that said, you can still get little batteries. Um, this one from out of the wood group was a 140 milligram battery. Um, if you go a little bigger, you can carry a... Um, this is a 300 milligram battery. We anticipate maybe a couple minutes of, char of flight on one of these guys and maybe 30 seconds on one of these guys. So we're not talking about long flight times. Um, but uh, that said, um, solar is interesting because it's one of these uh, power sources that um, area, it gets better as you go to small scale. Uh, so the power needed goes roughly as your mass. And, but the power you collect for a given solar panel relative to the size of the robot goes as L squared. So as you go smaller and smaller, area gets bigger relative to the power needed faster. And at some point you get to where in theory, provided you can make the solar array very light, which in theory is very possible. You can make these, there are solar arrays that are light enough that you can put them on a physical bubble actually. So they can make them in principle very thin and light. Um, and so there's this crossover somewhere maybe around a gram where below that size, in theory, it's possible to power your robot indefinitely from the sun. We'd love to get there. Uh, but in the meantime, what it's probably gonna look like is charging, uh, charging um, your drone and then flying intermittently. So we've started playing with that. This is a, uh, this is a solar powered drone. Um, and one of the things we realize is that this array kind of gets in the way. And so we built this, um, mechanism where the, the solar array folds out of the way uh, when you're flying. And then when you come down, it automatically flips out just by virtue of the ground effect, the increased pressure underneath the propellers here. I'll play that again. So this guy has I think it's a 5% duty cycle. So it's not great. These are not very efficient cells. These are amorphous cells, 5% efficient. Uh, there's cells that are much better than that and much lighter than that. So we think we can do better than 5% duty cycle. Uh, but it also, we added a little bit of autonomy. It, it, it won't land if there's not light and it will not land if there's um, a bump on the floor, for example. Um, so we're starting in that direction. Um, and then farther off is maybe exploring charging from uh, solar uh, cell phone towers or um, Wi-Fi access points. So there's some interesting questions there. Uh, okay, so um, I think that's it. That's uh, all, all the prepared remarks I, ha um, I had. Um, I'll just make one conclusion here. We've made a lot of progress toward these insect-sized robots, everything from sensing and power and control. Um, and I feel like we're at the cusp where we're, we're, we're very close to getting controlled hover for one thing, and we're starting to have an answer for how do we get uh, power on board. Um, and so I think in the next couple of years, they're gonna start to rival the incredible capabilities of insects. Um, and 
more than that, I, I, I think of them as a, as a vehicle to advance the state of the art in engineering across uh, many domains. And uh, you know, I sort of feel like they, uh, by trying to solve engineering challenges at the extreme size and weight and power uh, constraints of these guys, we're gonna, um, we're gonna see uh, dividends across all of engineering. So I'm very excited about that as well. Um, okay, so with that, uh, I will wrap up and say uh, thanks to the group. Uh, you guys are great. Uh, thanks to my collaborators, funding sources, um, and for you guys for uh, listening. And I will uh, open up for questions now. Thanks. Thank you, Sawyer, for the great talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, thank you, Sawyer. Uh, this is uh, very fascinating. I've been following you know, all these things for, for years now. Um, so the one thing that I wonder, the wonder is, you know that there was that famous thing that, um, you know, according to aerodynamics, bumblebees should not be able to fly, right? Um, sure, yep. <laughs> uh, now, how about the, you know, there, there is all discuss, discussion about power, right? Um, how quickly do they collect power from, you know, eating, you know, whatever sugary things they can find, right? Or, you know, whatever insects eat uh, and mm -hmm. how, you know, uh, I don't know, what, what is the power budget of, 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 the, of, of these insects and, you know, how, where do they collect the power and how quickly do they consume it? Um, I, um, I have yeah. heard that mm -hmm. honeybees are pretty bad efficiency wise from the standpoint of the fraction of the honey they bring back to the hive compared to how much they consume in the course of collecting it. I think I heard it was something crazy like only 10% of the energy they get flying around mm -hmm. all day comes back to the hive. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, a few other comments. So um, the, so the story on the, the bumblebee, there's this story that um, when, when aerodynamicists first started studying the bumblebee, they, what they did was they put the wing in, the, in a wind tunnel and then they turned on the wind tunnel and they measured the lift from the wing and they found that it was something like half as much lift as you would need to actually um, make the bumblebee take off. And I'm just, I'm just telling the story, Emilia, you probably, you probably know this, but I, I'll tell, tell it anyway for everybody else. Um, and so there's this mystery for a long time of what, you know, what is the bumblebee doing that it gets twice as much lift as what you see in a wind tunnel? Um, and the story there is that, um, and it was really figured out by Charlie, Elling, Charlie Ellington, I believe, uh, in, in the UK. Uh, uh, I forget it was Oxford or Cambridge, but anyway, maybe somewhere else. But anyway, what he, did, what he discovered was that um, if you do, um, it, it has to do with the leading edge vortex and stalling. So I'll relate it to what happens when you're flying an airplane and you pull up. Um, if you, if, if you um, so normally maybe you're flying like this on an airplane, your wings are horizontal. If you pitch back, you get lift, more lift and you go up like this. But at some point you have this experience, which is stall. And what stall is, is when you tilt it so far up that you have this leading edge vortex that gives you lift, but at some point it, for whatever reason, it falls off the back of the wing. And when that, that's called detaching. And when that leading edge vortex detaches from the wing, suddenly your lift drops precipitously by this factor of roughly two. So you're, you're, you fall, you're tilting, you're, oh, and then you, and, and what happens when you stall is you then suddenly loss of lift and fall. And so, um, so it's that leading edge vortex detaching. And so it turns out that what bumblebees do is that by rotating around a vertical axis with their wings, uh, it turns out that that stabilizes that leading edge vortex. It ends up peeling off the tip of the wing as it rotates. And so you end up that the um, vortex stays attached during a full wing stroke. Uh, and with this, then the, the bumblebee generates enough lift. And actually the robo fly takes advantage of that same phenomenon as well. Uh, so it's called delayed stall 
Um, and it's something that all insects and tiny flapping wing devices use. Uh, and with that, by keeping that vortex attached, we get much higher lift. So that's the story. <laughs> if those early aerodynamicists had first measured how much lift that bumblebee wing was producing when they first turned on the wind tunnel, they noticed that the lift was enough for a very short period of time before that vortex fell off the back of the wing. But they didn't do that experiment. <laughs> but people since then have done that. And uh, they, they, that's definitely what they've seen. Um, in terms of efficiency of the whole robofly relative to a bumblebee, um, I think it's pretty similar, actually. They, you know, they both use in the 50 milliwatts for a similar size um, animal. So, uh, you know, I will say that as well, too. I'm wondering about, you know, the, you know, the, you know, in a, in a sense, you know, what would the, what would the duty cycle look like? And where is the current technology compared to what we see in, you know, in animals, like in, you know, insects? Um, you know, you have, <laughs> on hand, you have some mechanism for storing, right? So, you know, the equivalent of like batteries or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, then you have the mechanism for recharging the batteries, right? So when you eat, right? Or where you, so you were doing this uh, thing with like a solar, uh, you know, um, you know the, one of the last things that you talk about. Um, and then, you know, how you convert that energy into propulsion or something that lets you fly, right? So, um, and there's really these three components, right? So how you get it in, how you get it out, and how much you can store that can like determine what is your duty cycle, right? So for, you know, how long can you fly and uh, how long do you need to uh, stop to recharge and uh, so on and so forth. Um, you know, just, just curious where we are standing, um, you know, compared to insects. Oh, I see. Huh. So, um, and maybe a re related would be the equivalent for slightly larger, like one of these palm sized drones is something we more can more readily test now. Um, that's I, I'm not yeah, an expert on like a dietary, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in, in Seattle, we have these crazy of, of insects, yeah. but. Uh, you know, just wondering, you know, how you convert, I don't know, like glucose or something like that into energy and versus how you convert some other form of energy that we use on these little yeah. robots. I mean, um, wouldn't that be great to be able to power these robots on glucose that you could collect from flowers? <laughs> That's an interesting idea. I do. Um, so the story is there, at least, is that you might be able to do that using fuel cells. There are fuel cells that can correct you know, can go straight from methane or other chemicals straight to electricity. The problem is that they all seem to require uh, to be relatively high above uh, atmosp uh, atmospheric temperature. And uh -huh. that's a problem for small scale yeah. things because they have this surface area to volume. So they need to expend relatively more amount of energy to just keep them warm for their size. So that has, unfortunately made it kind of difficult to do uh, fuel cells at least for small scale. Um, there might be other ways. I mean, of course, this is maybe a question for the biologists. Could you use proteins to um, catalyze the decomposition of glucose and somehow turn that into energy? Um, I, I don't know that. Yeah, that'd be interesting to think about. It seems like the sort of thing People are working on virus batteries, and so it might be that there's some way to do that. Um, very, yeah, uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, uh, it's a great question. You need a pretty interesting autonomous system to be able to find flowers and get nectar from them, but definitely not out of the question. Definitely, right, right, right. yeah. I, I'm just uh, wondering yeah. about <laughs> because in a sense, you know, when when, when you when we talk about the design of the wings and the wing stroke and you know the architecture, things. so essentially we are talking about how you deploy the power, right? Um, uh, and you mm -hmm. try to do that 
in some efficient way. Of course, you want to reduce the mass so that you reduce the power required for flight and things like that. But I was just wondering, you know, where we are standing in terms of how do you get that power in and how much, how long can you actually fly? Um, because in, at the end of the day, that also determines what kind of missions, you know, we can execute, right? Or what kind of tasks yeah. we can do with it. So I think, you know, I, I think a reasonable assumption is, you know, we'll probably get a couple of minutes of flight if we make with, with an off the shelf battery. So that plus the ability maybe to charge up in the course of a day and then fly again or a couple of times a day, something like that. Um, but that, you know, that, that definitely limits what you can do um, unless you're really good at, you know, plugging into wall outlets or finding radio frequency power sources and landing near them and charging from those. Um, but there, there's some interesting trade-offs there, right? I guess, you know, you could use a better algorithm or more powerful algorithm to get you closer to the charging point, for example, um, in exchange for a lighter battery. Or There's some interesting trade-offs there as well, too, that I don't really know how to, I don't know, I haven't thought it very detailed, let's say, and how to yeah, how I mean, I'm optimize clear. that. But, yeah, was, but there's a lot of, you know, how do you how do you weigh this, you know, the algorithm or the sensors you use against the size of the battery? There's lots of richness there, I, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't want to, to, to steal or to hold all of your time. I don't know if others have questions. Yeah, there are a couple of questions in the chat, at least. <clears throat> okay. I, can, I can talk them through. Uh, Jason Heath is asking, uh, uh, can you talk a bit about your plans for communication or information transfer, uh, for instance, pairwise or global? Are you mainly focused on data collection or actually having the robots complete some tasks? Uh, let's see. So um, my answers there are, I, I do think it will be possible for them to communicate with each other. A few remarks there. Um, Bluetooth is one channel that they could probably use, um, but even Bluetooth, which is a pretty low power channel, is ends up being actually a fair amount of power usage for an insect-sized robot. The lowest I think Bluetooth can use is four milliwatts or something, and in practice, it's more than that if you want to have a decent bandwidth. So if you know you're talking a couple hundred milliwatts to fly, now that you know Bluetooth ends up being a you know, a non-negligible fraction of that. Um, if you want to go really small, there's this technology called backscatter, which is a essentially it's sort of like the wireless equivalent to um, using a mirror to reflect uh, light that's coming from somebody else. So it's a way to transmit radio uh, communication over radio frequency without using any power at all, just by selectively reflecting it back to a host. Um, so that's probably what you need to do to go to really small scale NAT sized robots. Um, and uh, let's see, I think that, you know, I think there's, you know, I think what's, you know, another cool thing about tiny robots is you can imagine now deploying hundreds or thousands of them for the cost of just a few bigger robots. Um, so there's lots of questions there. Um, what if they work together? What if they communicate together? Um, yeah. Uh, uh, and in principle, they should be able to, I mean, the, the chip we're working on putting on board right now is going to have Bluetooth on board. So it, it, they're very small these days, thanks to the consumer electronics industry. So it's going to have Bluetooth. And so you could imagine making an ad hoc network of these guys and having them talk to each other and using that information collectively to find a plume more readily or that lots of, yeah, lots of things you could do there. Um, and then uh, lastly, I think he asked about um, having them complete their tasks. Uh, definitely, um, we look to uh, they're, they're collect insects that are collectives like termites and ants that carry big objects much bigger than themselves by working together or building like a termite mound or a uh, beehive that's much bigger than themselves. Um, I think those tasks are, I, I feel like the, the plume source finding is to my mind, the, the minimum viable product, it doesn't require a lot of precision localization. Um, it's, I think it's more feasible in the short term. Longer term, 
I mean, I guess termites can build mounds without doing perfect localization, but they, I think they need to be much more precise about what they're doing than, than a, a plume finding robot. So I think that's farther off, but I definitely think that's possible. You can imagine maybe building a house with a, a million of these little guys or something flying around, putting one grain of sand each or something like that. Um, yeah. So yeah, somebody definitely. in the chat. Somebody in the chat is also hinting at uh, doing surveillance and asking whether is there any counterindication <laughs> for doing that. <clears throat> Surve let's see. Surveillance is definitely something you can do with these guys. Uh, uh, double use of this technology for surveillance. Institutions preventing this use. Um, I think these guys fall under the same category as small drones, like palm-sized drones. Um, I, I, th I think we need to, I'm not sure what the right policy is there, but in these cases, I think we need to think about that carefully. Um, and there needs to be laws against, you know, illicit use of them. Um, we may need to use the screen door more if we're concerned about it. Um, but yeah, the, the, um, I mean, drones, they have, all drones have, I think we are only beginning to see the things that drones will be able to do. And I need to, I think we need to, we're, we're, they're here to stay and we're going to, we have, we have to, part of our job, I think, is people who think about drones have to be, uh, we have to think about how to make sure they're used in, in good ways and think about how to make sure they're not used in bad ways and, and, and um, what those technologies might be to, to prevent that if there's a technological approach versus if it's a political approach, something like that. So uh, super rich question, yeah. <laughs> yes, um, maybe is there other questions from the audience? I, I read them once from the chat, but maybe somebody wants to ask directly. Right, doesn't seem so. It's it's a very interesting topic. I think people will reach out for deeper questions. Uh, sure, feel free to email me. Thank you very much, Sawyer, for the talk. Good luck for, <laughs> hope to see these guys around here soon. <laughs> um, and thank you all for participating. See you all next week. Thanks, guys. Thanks for hosting, John. Thank you. <laughs>